Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the National Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering five conversations from Episode 60. Our special coverage of Madrigal Pharmaceuticals' release of Maestro Nash Phase 3 data, originally posted this past Wednesday. This conversation, also with a larger group, starts with Louise Campbell commenting on two specific benefits of the study. The fact that multiple metabolic measurements check a lot of boxes, as she puts it, in terms of liver disease. And second, that there is huge benefit for patients now that caregivers can tell them diet and exercise do not work. There's something else we can do. Mazenor Dean agrees somewhat with the latter thought, but notes that for F3 patients, drug therapy should probably start on the first visit, second visit latest. He also discusses the value of Hispanic patients being included in the study and what that says about ways we look at efficacy. Norn Schottenberg asks whether the relatively similar results at two dose levels build on or defeat the case for two dose levels. And Chris Cowdley states confidently that having two dose levels will be seen as a benefit as these results demonstrate. Louise asks how we can drill down into patients that did not succeed and Scott Friedman raises parallel issues around payer response and precision therapy in terms of non-success. He also notes that it may redefine use of placebo in clinical trials. Mike Patel goes on to ask what role bariatric therapies, notably surgery, might play in liver therapy and how we evaluate it. And through the rest of the discussion, Chris, Mazin, and I discuss ways that the scope of the data in this study and the rest of the magical program will emerge scientific program for years to come. Here in Nashville, where we all live, the world changed for good on Monday. This is a quick take on some of what that change might look like. It will be interesting in years ahead to look back on this conversation to see what we got right and wrong. And you get a sneak peek right now. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. And when you're done, join the conversation in our LinkedIn discussion group. How many different stakeholders stand to benefit from getting a successful trial over the line and getting it to FDA approval. Louise, I guess you're the only one we've not heard from yet. What are are we missing? Louise Campbell. Um, I agree with everybody that's um, had their input on it. And I was thinking I was going to start off with where Jean was, that the breadth of the comorbid conditions and metabolic diseases included in this trial just means that it ticks a whole load of different boxes when we talk about liver and, and poor liver health potentially in the future. But I think for me, when I think about about interactions with patients now. We can talk about if diet and lifestyle does not work for you, we have another option. We can hold and we can try diet and lifestyle. But actually, if you, it isn't successful, there is something else. And that is always a, a massive incentive that if you don't achieve the lifestyle and diet that's required, you're not a failure. And I think so much of the time we do focus on lifestyle, we do focus um, on those cornerstones, but it is really hard in primary care to get people to do that when it's the only thing you've got to continue to do. So by having these next steps and the encouragement in the field, I just think is such a great step for the patients and to thank every single patient, not only who's done Madrigal, but every single patient that's ever done a NASH study has contributed to what was released today that changes the future for every further person in the NASH and NAFLD space and a lot of the comorbid metabolic conditions because we've seen those safety profiles, which is highly encouraging. Mazen Nuruddin. I just want to agree, but I also want to bring up another angle, which is the following. Uh, I think diet and exercise are absolutely the first line of therapy as well as should be the therapy all the time while you're taking drugs. Here, I don't want to say, well, try weight loss. And I just want to make sure we're not saying try weight loss and exercise, and then we have a drug for you to try if you're not responding. The reason why uh, this trial included actually more F3s than F2s patients, I think they were in the 60% or so. And thus, I would argue that if you have the patient in the first visit in your office, he will say, you need to weight loss and exercise and sit down with them and tell them about weight loss and exercise is better if you have a nutritionist, because I'm sure none of us will spend enough time on that. But at the same time, if you have an F3 patient, I would argue uh, a drug should be started on that first visit uh, or at least the second second visit. Another thing also I, I liked about this study, in addition to the metabolic risk factors that um, Jorn mentioned, they had also about 20% or so Hispanics, and this is a little bit on the higher side from what we have seen previously. And this is encouraging because it started looking at the patients at high risk. So there are a lot of positive things that need to be looked at. The last point I also want to make, I want to go back to Chris's analogy of looking at the drug and its efficacy. He said three folds 
uh, more for natural solution. And I do agree with that. It was almost two folds for fibrosis improvement, rather than looking at the abs- like the absolute numbers across trials. This is how I want to look at it because you know the histology is all over the place. So I think this is the right approach that uh, Chris started. Jörn Schattenberg. To follow up on that and 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 feedback, you know, get maybe feedback from Chris, who's done a lot of drug development in his career, is um, something that was said in the press release was today. Well, we're going to be, we're seeing two effective doses. So we're taking two doses forward. And, uh, you know, we're looking at top line data. So there's a little bit more efficacy, a little bit more side effects versus a little less efficacy, a little less side effects. If if it's one drug, do we need those two doses? And not sure anybody has thought on that. Chris Cowdley. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump. Uh, I'll jump in. I do think that it's useful to have this information because first of all, you know, we've gotten pretty, um, choreographed into standard approaches with regard to enrolling patients in trials, F2, F3 fibrosis, compensated liver disease, platelet counts are normal, all liver functions clearly normal. You know, as we move forward and we get a better understanding of the indirect measures of activity of thyroid hormone beta receptor agonists with regard to sex hormone binding globulin or other features, uh, we're going to want the flexibility for patients with a broader spectrum of liver disease because uh, we, I think, would like to have the option of knowing uh, that there's some efficacy that can be offset by potentially tolerability or clearance of the drug or some other factor that would allow it to be used in a broader range of patients. The other point I think is important is that, as we know, who are in the trenches and take care of a lot of patients, uh, every patient is different. So there is a dose-response relationship in terms of uh, adverse events um, uh, that was reported. Uh, And some patients may have tolerability issues that might require step-down therapy. Uh, So so knowing that you don't have to sacrifice efficacy if the patient is not able to tolerate the optimum dose it gives us as clinicians flexibility. So I think both uh, having data that shows efficacy in a broader range of patients that might potentially be better suited for a lower dose, and also more importantly, show that tolerability can be affected uh, variably in different patients, but they can step down and still get efficacy, I think uh, provides useful information. So at this point, it's sort of a, a best case scenario, if you will, where you have efficacy shown with both doses and um, uh, you know what trade-off you might have in terms of efficacy maybe you'll pick up in terms of tolerability. On that point, the, Scott was saying earlier, it's a welcome result for everybody else because there were 76% of patients that didn't. So drilling down into who did not succeed. We, yes, I was really excited to see a 20, 21% Hispanic, but if they are the percentage that didn't respond, then we're looking at targeting the right populations. If we look at the average BMI, I think it was 36. Would the, is the lower dose better in those with a BMI between 30 and 32, for example? Drilling down in who did, but more importantly, drilling down in who did not respond um, in these tests for me is important because then we become more specific of who we're going to treat in the future the same as we were in the same way with genotypes one to four different things target different people the wealth of data that we can get out of this um, for me is just phenomenal and um, it's going to take years but I'm excited about those years coming. Scott Friedman. If I can jump in, I, I completely agree um, and put a, to put a fine point on it. What are the genetic, if any, makeup or the histologic or the molecular features of those who responded versus not? And of course, now we have some new problems, which is, are we going to be able to convince payers to pay for it? Number one. Number two, since it didn't work in most patients, how do we identify those patients, get them off the drug if we can't pre-select them so that they can get onto something else and maybe move more towards personalized therapy? And the, the final implication or one other implication is, of course, that clinical trials going forward will no longer be placebo controlled, I would imagine, unless they're either going to be patients who are being compared to resmetaram or uh, in combination with resmetaram and, and another drug, or have some, which I can't think of, some contraindication to using resmetaram, but can get a different drug. So uh, this really uh, shifts the whole ecosystem considerably uh, from those perspectives as well. And uh, obviously, we have a lot to learn. I, I really like the 
precision medicine that uh, Scott mentioned. I actually, I'm asking a question. I'm not sure if uh, arismeterone will become a standard of care for trials if it's a conditional approver versus the placebo continuum. I, I don't know what's the right answer. Well, it's it. possible. I don't know either. You, you guys might know better than me. But also, I want to, I think the opposite of precision medicine, and I like, again, precision medicine more, the question is we have to be reminded this is a chronic disease that took many years to take in place. So this is a 52 weeks trial. And I don't want to, I want to be flexible in terms of looking for responders, non-responders. Would a longer duration lead to a better imp- uh, improvement? Uh, another thing is, I really think the, f- the field is going to be not a drug better than the other. Uh, rather, you want to add, for instance, the GLP-1 to TH beta receptor and see how they do together, which is the Scott's point, that's going to be probably going to be compared in the future. So a little bit patient with the responders versus non-responder analysis, and let's see what it does in the long term and how adding other medications will lead to additional, even synergistic. Mike Bottel. I I just, I I wanted a couple minutes ago to comment just on what everybody was saying. The tailored therapy approach is going to be the future for sure. And the subset analysis of the data will help us get there. There were some, uh, Louise mentioned the diet and exercise, which of course everybody talks about. There's also gastric balloon and gastric bypass. So, you know, at which point do some of these other uh, options come into play? So there's the pharmacological option probably for the masses, but we're going to have to tailor probably based on the data, which treatment option is best for that patient. One of the things I find really exciting in this conversation takes me there and particularly Mazen's point. Uh, They made the point that this is a 52-week conditional endpoint in a 54-month outcome study. So we're going to be looking at these patients for a lot longer, this set of patients, for a lot longer even than what's being reported today. And they also made a point of discussing the other four trials that are going on in parallel, right? So the amount of data that we're going to be looking at on resmeteron as we go forward is really compelling in in both uh, its breadth and its length. When you lay that alongside of butacolic acid and the idea that we've already got patients who've been on that for more than four years because they continued their trials, we're starting to see the emergence of, I think, a much richer and multi-dimensional sets of data, if you will, that will uh, allow research for years, but also will uh, allow fertile minds to go in just a ton of different directions, which I find really, I find really exciting. The other point that I think uh, is important to emphasize is um, not only what this means for patients, the investor community, drug developers, and others is just in terms of uh, moving the science forward. I mean, we had a lot of information about FXR agonists and why they might be effective in this particular condition, um, you know, for, for a long time. The concept that a, you know, selective thyroid hormone beta receptor agonists might potentially uh, make the liver metabolically more efficient, maybe improve not just beta oxidation, but fat disposal, de novo lipogenesis, many other factors. Uh, But just in terms of the science of understanding how functionally hypothyroid many patients with NASH are, just as we've now learning more and more about how they tend to have sarcopenia that is not recognized and not suspected for a long time is a huge advance. So this was in some ways a proof of concept. We had a lot of preliminary data suggesting that there was uh, there was a good likelihood that the results would be positive. But uh, in terms of now reversing back uh, and re- reverse engineering, understanding the science, I think from a translational perspective, there will be huge opportunities. And I think this will have implications for patients uh, even who are not on treatment at the present time in terms of how do we better investigate Uh, thyroid function in the liver, the liver's sensitivity to thyroid hormone, and the downstream effects of thyroid hormone receptor agonism in this condition and other conditions that may be adjacent to NASH, if you will. To build on Chris' comments, uh, he just said and earlier, and what he said, Roger, uh, we're going to have a trial that is ongoing for years. So the LDL effect, I do wonder if it's going to continue over time and we're going to start seeing MACE uh, favorable effects. And I hope that will be the case. So here, like you're starting addressing the disease as a whole body or other, or at least from too big comorbidity standpoint. And I hope that will be the case. So there's an excitement uh, with the LDL data as well. And now back to Roger. 
We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We will be back next week with the rest of our year-end reviews. Two episodes that include conversations with Mazen Nuruddin, Ken Cousy, Jeff Lazarus, Stephen Harrison, Naima Khoury, and Ian Rowe. You want to hear all of it. Until then, wishing all of you a wonderful holiday season and best wishes for a fantastic 2023. Stay safe, surf on. We'll see you next year on the podcast. Bye-bye now.